you know, there's, there's so much to unpack when we're talking uh, AGI or AI, uh, because it is quite uh, the innovation and it is quite the accelerant or catalytic uh, innovation to engage, and especially with such uh, a broad and huge uh, industry such as education uh, and technology. But many thanks to uh, Jay Ramnadal, the CEO of PC Training and Business College, for shedding light on the possibilities, the capabilities, as well as uh, the urgency to action and transformation of innovation, such as this intelligence that it demands from institutions, uh, from societies, as well as the public sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the opportunity to moderate a conversation on accessible and inclusive fintech innovation. We got a glimpse uh, from Jay's uh, presentation onto the types of capabilities and opportunities, particularly if we are applying the lens of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and for this, I'd like to call upon my expert panelists to make their way onto the stage. Please welcome Keith Sabilika, the Senior Fintech Specialist at the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. He's joined by Graeme Cunning, the Chief Product Officer at ECORCA. And rounding off our panel is Vincent Majavu, the Technical Lead at All Mutual. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel on financial technology. Keith Graham and uh, Vincent, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation where we have been tasked with the oracle of financial technology, having a look at uh, you know, some of the technologies and some of the solutions that have been successful in promoting inclusive uh, financial uh, 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 engagement, uh, as well as if we can also looking at maybe some of the failures as well that haven't been uh, so successful. We heard about Mbesa, uh, it wasn't so successful in South Africa, but in Kenya it is thriving and in other East African markets, uh, but also taking a look at the journey of the lessons uh, in the path and opportunities for financial technology and of course some trends that have been embedded in how you're operating in your respective roles uh, and respective institutions. Um, and I suppose as we set the scene for this conversation and I open the floor to my panelists, uh, what is a financial technology solution that currently you are excited about that and that you truly feel is promoting financial inclusion and to the theme of today, unlocking tomorrow's innovation today? Uh, Graham, let me start with you. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in our world, maybe just to set the, the context, we, we we service small businesses in South Africa with payment solutions and technologies. And I think for the longest period of time, one of the biggest frustrations for, for smaller business owners and, and for merchants is the, the sort of cycle that money takes between a customer buying a good or a service, you know, in their store and then actually receiving that 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 money and, and being able to use it or plow it into you know further product or working capital or whatever it is so i think certainly um you know the innovation that's happening around cutting that cycle time down and kind of speeding up i mean in, in south africa it's the rapid payments program or you know pay shop as, it, as it's now known and it's, it's been rolled out in india and i think that is definitely a one of the biggest innovations, certainly in the financial and the payment space that, that we've seen is, is the time to settle merchants and allowing them effectively to run their business because they're not waiting for you know those payments to flow through. So um, we, we're paying a lot of attention to that. I mean, I think you know the, the previous theme around you know the emergence of, of AI with the ability to, I mean, there, there, there's, there are a lot of like buzzwords out there at the moment, but I think the ability to really interrogate what's happening with data and to make decisions around um you know i guess smart decisions decisions that can be personalized or that that are i guess relevant to specific use cases by using technology so certainly things like you know analyzing data analyzing transactions seeing what activity is happening trying to pull out insights or trends and play that back to business owners in terms of what they can use those insights for and, and hopefully run their, their businesses a lot more efficiently than they could maybe five or 10 years ago. So those are, I think, that some of the exciting things that, uh, that, that we look forward to. 
Absolutely. So harnessing uh, the data to make these data driven decisions uh, in business, as well as the time reduction um, in payments. Uh, I see you nodding your head quite vigorously, Vincent, when he was talking to data. I think that's your division. But before we get into that, when we talk to uh, currently a, an exciting uh, financial technology solution, what is one that you would be excited about currently? Um. I can think of like items that we worked on during the highs of COVID. Um, and it's going to be a little bit anticlimactic because it wasn't a groundbreaking technical solution. But in terms of the numbers that we saw internally at the organizations, those were groundbreaking. Those were numbers we've never seen before. Um, targets that teams had previously thought were un unreachable. And this was just because we started adding some of our sales journeys and services onto WhatsApp. So there was just a, a conversation within the organization to say what can be done to help our customers. They can't make it to the store. What this, what's on everybody's hands? They phone. Where's everybody right now? Uh, digitally, they're on WhatsApp. And WhatsApp has a, a, an API capability where you can start plugging in some features in there. That went out and um, was uh, a big success within the organization. So I'm really excited by things like that in technology, not trying to solve um, glossy um, problems and create complex solutions, but creating stuff that really works. So we still look at that as something successful. Moving forward, an item I am I'm happy about right now that we're still working on now is building on a platform that will scale because we're not just building for the organization we serve here in South Africa. The leadership I work with have Come up with a really good strategy to say let's all work as one technical team across Africa. So it's that project that we've got in the pipeline that we're working to try and drive that strategy forward for the organization to say let's leverage our technical capability across the continent. Absolutely. And I think even when we're talking about finance and if we want it to be inclusive, it's not going to be as glitzy and glammy and sometimes even requiring smartphones or the latest um, within the cult of Samsung and, and Apple. Um, but I think APSA uh, or rather access um, is going to be something that is super important. Keith, I'm going to throw uh, the very same question to you, an exciting uh, fintech solution that you are currently uh, excited about. Right, no, thank you for the question. Um, so coming from a regulatory point of view, you know, looking at the various fintech segments that we have, you know, looking at payments, investments, insurtech, the exciting innovations that we are seeing, they are mostly coming from the payment space, um, mainly because you know you find payment payments is the gateway to the financial system. Every day, everyone needs to transact. Uh, people, businesses. So we're seeing a lot of you know, innovations coming from that space. You know, looking at South Africa, it houses a number of migrants. You know, fintechs they are coming in to try and solve for you know remittances. You know, to, to assist people living in South Africa who want to send money back to their home countries. So you know, a lot of innovation is coming from that space. You know, a number of people in sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa as well, they are they are unbanked. You know, these you know the level of financial inclusion is also at a, it's, it's low, so we're finding fintechs coming in to to fill in the gap that you know your traditional financial institutions, your banks, your insurance companies, they are, they are not so much interested in getting into, but they are coming in to fill in that space. You know, take for example, mobile money, Pesa. You know, those fintechs they came in to cover that space that traditional financial systems we're not covering and in a way they have helped to, to improve financial inclusion. Then looking into, into the future, what we are seeing, we are seeing a lot of um, embedded financial solutions coming in, you know, non-financial companies starting to embed or to include financial solution into their products. You know, you talk of e-commerce platforms, you're finding you know, you go and take a lot, you can make a payment, you can get credit, there's buy now, pay later, you know, so we are seeing a lot of that coming in. We also seeing some innovations coming in, you know, taking advantage of, you know, uh, decentralized finance, you know, crypto assets coming into play. We're finding that um, fintechs are starting to, you know, to take advantage of that leveraging on 
digital uh, ledger technology, trying to solve for also for cross-border payments. You know, they're trying to to use that technology to, to, to make sure that you know payments are made faster, quicker, and easier for, for individuals. So in essence, you know, um, payments is the exciting innovation that we are seeing. We're finding that digital um, decentralized finance is, is, is very strong and also that embedded finance is also you not know, taking advantage of whatever is taking place in the financial sector. Absolutely. And I want to stick with you, uh, Keith, for a bit longer and, and stick with the ecosystem and the environment, the particularly the, the regulatory environment. We are seeing quite a couple of products coming out of South Africa in front of and behind the scenes with the technologies um, that are being innovated. But before we even get into the trends in the future, what is currently the regulatory environment for product development innovation? What is possible? And I think even in that, if you could shed some light on the active role of FCSA in actualizing and making sure that uh, you know the kinds of innovations that come out are the right ones for the very multifaceted market that South Africa currently sits in. No, thank you. That's that's a, that's a good question. So from a regulatory point of view, Anything is possible when it comes to fintech. I think the sky is just the limit. Fintechs, innovators, they just need to be cognizant of the regulation that's in play so that they, you know, they are playing within the confines of, of regulation and also making sure that their innovations, they are not, um, you know, they're treating customers fairly. I think that's that's one important thing to take advantage of. Looking at FSCA as a as a regulator, what they have done in order to assist uh, fintechs from a product development perspective, you know, they have recognized that innovation is no longer coming from incumbents like from your big banks, from insurance companies, and they've set up fintech departments. You know, you look at FSCA, we've got a fintech department where I'm coming from, where we are mostly responsible for conducting research, you know, monitoring fintech trends so that we can advise the regulator when it comes to future regulation, what needs to be done, how we can, you know, assist uh, fintechs and, you know, um, improve innovation in that space. The same applies to the Reserve Bank. They have also set up a fintech department, which is almost doing the same thing. And the next thing that uh, regulation or what uh, the South African financial regulators have done, they've come together and collaborated. Now we are talking of FSCA, the Reserve Bank, National Treasury, uh, SARS, the FIC, they've come together, formed what we call the Intergovernmental Fintech Working Group. Mainly the aim there is to assist fintechs navigating the regulatory environment. They understand that there's so much innovation taking place. The regulatory environment is very complex. Fintech startups, they need to be guided so they can utilize the innovation hub facility, which is made up of two facilitators. We've got the regulatory guidance unit, where from a product development perspective, like from an idea, either a fintech or an individual, they can just send a query. From that query, there is a collaborative, coordinated response that's coming from regulators to give uh, guidance in terms of what regulation they need to adhere to or what they where they need to register how they can navigate that space and then in some instances we and i can i can give some examples of that that i think three four years from the time that the innovation hub was formed we have assisted more than 180 fintechs two-thirds of which are like startups or companies that are not even operational where we're just receiving queries and we we're giving advice, we're giving clarifications or guidance. Some fintechs have ended up being licensed even, and they are now fully operational and you know doing well in the sector. So that's 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 like a success story that we're getting from South African regulators. We also have the regulatory guidance unit, um, uh, that's the, the, the regulatory sandbox, where we we understand that some innovations they are pushing the boundaries of regulation and we need to test them in a controlled environment before we we can roll them out into the into the bigger uh, market and the regulators will be watching monitoring the risk 
And that's been uh, operating, I think, for the past two, three years. We have received over 50 applications, nine uh, solutions went in for testing. I think eight have tested successfully. And so that's that's what the regulators are doing in, in assisting fintech startups so that they can navigate this complex environment and so that they can they can they can uh, progress with innovation. Absolutely. And I think to, to progress uh, with innovation, there are multiple stakeholders, you mentioned regulators, but also society and many other stakeholders that are very critical uh, to the conversation of, I think, moving the needle along to ensure that the promotion of financial inclusion or financial inclusion uh, rather is active. And Graham, I'm going to come to you because whenever we talk about financial inclusion or financial technology or financial innovation, it's very difficult to not bring in payments uh, into the conversation. And it's all car engages primarily uh, with startups and uh, small businesses and SMEs uh, across the country. And when we're talking about how Ipoca innovates as well, what do you believe is uh, the trade-off that needs to happen or that does happen in order to ensure that it does, uh, or financial inclusion does happen uh, in the the space that currently exists from an ECOCA perspective, but also from the the small businesses that you that you serve. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good question. I think you know my my background is um, for many years I've worked in media and entertainment, so I'm I'm still fairly new to this space, and I, and like no disrespect to, to to Keith on the regulatory side. Like I think. I think it's it's obviously come a long way in, in the last sort of four or five years and, and, and a lot is happening in this space. I mean, it still, I guess, blows my mind that every institution does a what we call a FICA check and everybody does it, you know, a slightly different way. And it, it's for customers, it's quite a it's quite a burdensome hurdle to get across. I mean, obviously necessary um, for the industry. So, so I think, you know, what we tend to do is is look at problems like that, look at I guess real merchant needs. What are the problems that they're dealing with? What are the, you know, the, the I, I guess the drive to move merchants into like digital transacting for us is is a, is a big motivator because you know we play on the fact that cash is inefficient. Um, it's expensive to move cash around. It's dangerous in this country to move cash around. So how do we? I guess look at the problems involved with transacting and and how do we come up with creative ways of solving those problems everything from kind of the FICA process up front or how do you put processes in place to try and work within the regulation but completely like push the boundary or, or break the norm because i think for far too long you know the big big institutions in this country have really serviced the top end of the market to sort of tier one merchants and and the little guy who's running a business you know informally or formally has has traditionally been ignored so you know for us i guess the innovation is is really looked at you know what are the what what are the standard operating procedures that are in place how much pain do they create for merchants and and how do we operate around that how do we you know for a long time i mean you probably know us for our physical card machines um, and for a long time card machines have been in the market those those things have you know banks will rent you a card machine on a monthly basis we took we took the approach that we'd like to put a card machine at a very low cost in fact mostly subsidized cost to us it costs us money to put a card machine in your shop and reduce your transaction fees but we know that you know we can build a longer relationship with you as a merchant uh, as a result and and you're not being serviced as a merchant as a result of the fact you know that that um that the banks are ignoring you. So I think to go back to your question around, you know, what are the trade-offs and, and how do you innovate? I think the, the innovation comes from trying to understand what those problems look like. The trade-offs for us, sometimes you may be rushing things to market um, and and that's necessary. Like I think we we would rather get things into into the hands of a merchant that are maybe not perfected or super polished. Um, but are starting to add value, and those are some trade-offs that you make. And, and I think you know a lot of technology companies or product product teams will will, will adopt that approach. Um, I think you know the other trade-offs are 
from time to time, there is no way around that regulation. And, you know, you, as much as your intentions as a fintech are, are maybe very good and, and you're, you know, you, you're, you're working on a solution that is potentially groundbreaking for a merchant, the regulation is there for a reason and, and you've got to work within that. So there are trade-offs that you're going to need to make. Um, so I think those are yeah, those are probably examples to, to share. Is it is it a hard sell because and especially with with smaller merchants because we are in Africa and cash is still very much king. Um, and when you talk about all these challenges um, and uh, of course uh, that are linked to compliance that are very very necessary, is it still a hard sell to the smaller guys to say this is the efficiency or this is uh, productivity that you can get to optimize your business if you go the technological route? I think it's becoming a lot easier. Five years ago, it probably was a, a, a lot harder of a sell. I mean, yeah. COVID happened. We all know what happened during COVID. You know, people switched to digital payment methods, tapping cards, didn't want to handle money. So I think the industry as a whole moved probably five or six years forward just through that, you know, that that, that the pandemic event. Um, I think it's, you know, when, when you wrap, and, and we're very careful not to just brand ourselves or, or, or kind of put our stamp on, you know, on, on the map as a, as a card machine company, like there's a whole bunch behind that, that that we need to make our merchants and and the broader market aware of. And the fact that you know you can do online transacting or you can send payment links to customers, um, you know who may be in a different province, like that's something that cash, you know, yeah. doesn't solve. For you. So so there are use cases and there are opportunities, I guess, for you as a small business owner to be able to run your business in ways that cash never allowed you to do and for us to offer the, you know put those offerings in front of merchants make them aware of it um, as well as all the ecosystem that wraps around that visibility on your transactions reporting the ability to track your 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 cash book the ability to manage your expenses versus your revenue like all of that those are all tools that we want to put in, in in the hands of a small business owner to help them run a better business and i think the sell becomes a whole lot easier when you you know, when you can paint that picture and it's not just about, well, don't use cash, use a credit card or, or you know, there's it, it, a bigger story to tell. Absolutely. The language matters um, and, and where you're having the conversation, I think, matters even more. Um, Vincent, I'm going to move to you. We've touched on regulation. We've touched on small businesses within the ecosystem. Uh, individual society, um, you know, mobile has been quite uh, a conversation, particularly around uh, payments. We've seen uh, Kenya and other East African markets being very successful when they are using uh, mobile payments to promote this financial inclusion that we're talking about. South Africans, I'd like to think, have more SIM cards uh, and cellular phones um, than they do active business cards or, or rather business accounts. Um, when we're talking about, you know, a vital component of being a part of uh, the financial inclusion in ecosystem and being intimate with the technology, with the innovation, so that we can experience the impact, could mobile perhaps be the preferred um, or corrective route to ensuring that each and every individual in this room has an active part to play in the financial inclusion conversation? I think there's definitely room for for more innovation to happen with mobile in South Africa because something like um, business is so simple and, and frictionless for customers to use, and and yet it didn't really take take off on on our side. So there might be other reasons for that, and maybe the market isn't ready for for something like that. What we are observing is just a different trend in behavior. Um, is that customers are more comfortable using apps in South Africa. So we've got a lot of people who are really comfortable using apps. So if you can't put it onto an app, put it there. But because you also have a huge market of people who are in rural areas and the um, the, the demographics that we have in terms of the customer base, not everybody affords a phone that can store apps and, and so on. And yet we have a huge customer base where we're finding that we need to cater to everybody. So it's also choosing the right technology on our side to get everybody active. So we've exercised as many options as possible in our end. Um, mobile app is growing, it'll continue to grow. Uh, WhatsApp is allowing you for, for, for transacting where we can be, we are, we are transacting, staying within regulations as well. 
On your phone, we also building on uh, USSD uh, platforms where you can, you know, the star one for one uh, journeys, uh, for example, to enable other customers to also transact. So companies can build on all of those platforms and continue to innovate within South Africa. So we're seeing that being used and everything else is growing slowly. What I'm also What's also happening with people digitizing, so because it's great work that's happening on Ecoca as well, getting more people working on the digital platforms, engaging with us uh, digitally. Now, crime too um, starts to target you in those areas, and you have to come up with creative ways to address that. And I'm enjoying what I'm seeing happening behind the scenes is that the conversations that happened earlier around machine learning and artificial intelligence, those are being brought in within organizations. And I'm sure it's not just all well, mutual, but it's in many places. And it's being made accessible. Um, the barrier to entry isn't as high as you would think it is. So um, building threat detection and um, all those fraud detection systems behind the scenes, at least that's kind of helping us deal with all of those um, issues as well. So the development is definitely happening on mobile. It will continue to grow, but uh, South Africa, the training is very different. Uh, it's, it's a spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the continuous conversation and something that I that I usually hear around the conversation of um, fintech and inclusion is that fraud criminals are very creative and they do a really good job at sharing the innovations um, and that the people on the right side of uh, the conversation don't do as much sharing. So I think that's also um, something that is is, is quite important. Uh, Vincent, I'm going to stick with you on, you know, the technologies that 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 you're touching to the builders, the, the startup founders, the innovators who are wanting to be a part of the conversation or perhaps are a part of the conversation. I know we've got a fintech uh, founder who was engaging in blockchain. They're, they're all of these you know, traditional and emerging technologies that are coming to task. Um, what are technologies that you know builders should be keeping in place, whether they are in the ecosystem or not? Because we did touch that, you know, FinTech is a plug and play uh, in various, if not all, um, the ecosystems and the industries. So for them to be specifically impactful, what are the measures uh, or the kinds of technologies that they're going to have to keep their eye on or even embed into their products? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start with the popular one, blockchain, right? I think it's more about solving the problem for your customers, for the right audience. We don't have people at this point in time in, in our country, it's my opinion, that are ready to adopt the blockchains. But as a technology, it's really great for young people who are growing up in their IT careers or are interested in building it. It definitely has a future. The reason I think we're not particularly ready is there's two types. You have a public and a private one. So private, private blockchain solutions can work very well and are probably being built within banks. We don't know, maybe they're not showing, and they may be using it because it's really good for that sort of um, work. It's also good for building on towards uh, digital asset management. So it helps artists, um, whether you, you make pictures, music, whatever, in terms of managing one of those content players as well. So it, it is an emerging market. Barrier to entry on that is tricky because now people have to engage with you in crypto. To engage in crypto, you need crypto wallets. Now you've got to educate people. How do you set up a crypto wallet? How do you manage? How, you know, how do you transfer funds? That becomes a whole other issue. And, and that's why I think that one is great, but we're not ready for it. The machine learning items and the uh, artificial intelligence pieces, those are definitely must learn for anybody because it's not just fintech uh, financial institutions that will benefit from the technology. It's a skill set that can be used everywhere. And what you're going to see happening is, like what they did with ChatGPT, once someone has created another financial uh, model that they believe is reusable, that they can sell to somebody else to say, you can use our financial module for financial education. It's five, it's five cents per request. You know, you will see such organizations uh, coming up. There will be such innovations uh, that will be built. It's maybe not out there, but it's on the works. So I think definitely paying attention to machine learning and AI mm -hmm. is better suited than blockchain. 
Absolutely. And I think to to your point around, you know, all of these technologies, they they, they need compliance. And at times it's usually a catch up uh, situation that's happening with the regulation uh, market, be it SARS, um, be it the Reserve Bank, uh, be it associations uh, that are catching up with the fintech uh, and the technologies that are out there. But it's something um, that is uh, that is quite critical uh, to this. Uh, and Keith, we, we briefly touched this in your introductory uh, comments um, talking to subtech, um, which is uh, supervisory technology. Um, you know, people, process, and I'd like to think technology being central uh, to actualizing not only for the professionals, but of course the innovators um, who are in the room. Compliance is something that's very, very key. If you can, I think because of time, maybe one case study uh, to just illustrate how instrumental complying and collaborating with CF rather FS, <laughs> FCSA <laughs> is important uh, for, for the entrepreneurs out there. Okay, no, thank you for that. So it's the regulation, what it does, I think it, it creates a level playing field for, for the fintechs, for the consumers, even for the business. So it's, it creates that, that playing field that allows everyone to thrive Consumers are protected. Businesses are operating in an environment that's that's being regulated, that's being monitored by by regulators. So I think that's that's one important point to make. The other important point to make on that is that uh, complying with FSCA, it's it's more like it's an indirect stamp of approval, because you know regulators they go through a rigorous process to make sure that the fintech, the organisation is is ticking all the necessary boxes. And that that allows you to to you know, to gain trust and confidence from various stakeholders in in the space. I think the last point that I can make because of time is it allows you to scale your your business. You know we have seen this with other fintechs. Whenever they start operating and they have reached certain scale, they start to engage regulators so that they are moving in the same direction. We look at, for example, um, PESA, they did the same. When they reached a certain scale, they started engaging their regulators, you know, telling them about their business model, what they are seeing, and regulators started to move in the same direction. In South Africa, the same thing is happening, but we're seeing this mostly coming from incumbents, from big banks, insurance companies. Whenever they develop or innovate something, they engage the regulators on their business models so that Regulators, they are aware. They know what they are, what they are doing, what the sector is 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 is, is, is experiencing. And whenever they sit down and try to think regulation, they have got that at the back of their mind, and it sort of like guides them in that. So those are like some of the the examples that would really help you know, fintechs to comply with FSCA. You know, I think the last point that I can make is just legal compliance. You don't want to spend more time you know, being fined, you know, you know, taken to court, you know, license cancelled and all that. It really helps to just being compliant, getting licensed. You know, there are a lot of scams that take place within the financial space. So that really helps to, you know, to, to cover that that space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And, and again, even incumbents uh, are, are being fined in various uh, other regions. Um, and even, you know, we've seen recently a lot of fintech startups uh, being shut down. Um, again, because compliance is not the very first thing on top of mind. Uh, I mean, raising pre-seed is usually the most important thing, but I think uh, it's also really important to uh, comply, particularly in the sectors that you would be serving. Uh, Graham, uh, you know, I want to continue this theme um, that Keith really brings in on the congruency of innovating and educating your market. And I think even the inverse of that happening, um, you know, through monitoring and evaluation, when ECOCA innovates, um, is it at a congruent level of educating its, its customers or maybe even um, leapfrog it uh, as it is innovating? And if you can, maybe give us insight into, you know, what fits into the innovation uh, puzzle from the team uh, when you are talking, how do we take it from A to B, but also make sure that we don't leave our customers behind? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big topic. We could talk for, for many hours on it. I, I mean, I guess at, at the 
core of what we do, we're a very purpose driven team. So I guess understanding, as I said earlier, the, the, the pain points that our merchants are going through and, and what problem are we trying to solve, I guess, is at, at, at the core of that. Um, in, in terms of, you know, processes that we go through, we've we, uh, we we run multiple workshops. Um, we gather research. We we go and do interviews with merchants. We try and understand competitors. We understand. We try and understand. You know where, where the trends are going, um, and, and where the technology is going. And and I think you know we live in an incredible time where technology, be it you know generative AIs, and um, are allowing you to do things like. Um, you know, open your call centers for for 24 seven. You don't have to have bums in seats. You know, throughout throughout every hour of the day, um, you, that, that they're allowing us to to write code faster than ever before. That's not to say that you're going to displace engineers or support teams. It's just that I think where you experiment and and where where you step into the realm of what technology can offer you, you start to unpack like efficiency gains. And and as much as you know, I want to say. And don't quote me on this, but like my gut is telling me there's probably a 20 to 30 percent efficiency gain to be had by using some of these generative tools, mm -hmm. particularly in like an engineering environment where it's less about, you know, spitting out your five page PowerPoint presentation using ChatGPT. It's more about, you know, how do I understand the problem that I'm trying to solve? What are the variables that I'm writing into my code or my product? How do I cut down on almost like predictive text? Um, type scenarios where you are getting those efficiency gains, so the human is still very much involved. So I think using technology is 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 definitely at the core of, of what we try to do there. Um, and the feedback loop is also quite an important one because you know there, there, there's a there's a saying in, in in product circles if you know for the product innovators in the audience. Like your first foray into deploying something is never going to be successful. It's probably going to take you five, six, seven attempts and failures before you actually figure out, okay, this is actually the way the problem should be solved. You know, it's very different to the way you thought it would be solved. So how do you get that feedback back into your team and how fast can you cycle that feedback back into your team? So I think that all speaks to, you know, certainly on our side, what is the culture that you can build um, internally? How how close can you 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 match that culture to like the purpose or the the problem that you're trying to solve for your your end customer, be it a merchant or a customer, whatever whatever product or service you're building, and how quickly can you cycle that feedback loop? I think those are kind of key ingredients that um, you know anyone who's thinking of an idea or hacking away at you know at building something in this space, those are the key ingredients that that you need to keep in mind. Absolutely. And uh, as I invite uh, your closing remarks, uh, you know, Keith, you mentioned uh, a sandbox. Um, and I think for, for maybe Innovation Festival 2024, we have uh, a sandbox. Box. Uh, we begin to put in the tools or open open innovation, as they call it, right? Um, to really engage and connect and looking at how do we better innovate and use technology to be catalytic uh, to the innovations that we'll be bringing forth uh, to task. Uh, in one sentence, uh, what would be one innovation or a measure or an intervention uh, that you would put in the Innovation Festival 2024 sandbox to, you know, ensure that Durban is a part of uh, the innovation ecosystem uh, and can invite the innovators, the fintech entrepreneurs uh, who are engaging in impactful and inclusive innovation. Vincent, I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to uh, invite Keith and then Graham to close the session. Um, in one sentence, I say it's exposure to the solutions that are being put built out there. Um, that are currently leading the way, not just the the front end the final product, but also what happens behind the scenes. Just to um, encourage people to see, oh, I think I can understand that, and I can be a part of it. Okay. That was not one sentence, but we'll say it was a sentence with many comments. Um, Keith, I think I'm also going to have many comments. <laughs> but I, I think from a regulator point of view, innovations that are pushing the boundaries of of regulation, um, you know. Graham mentioned FICA problems, you know, if we can get some innovations that are trying to um, solve for ident uh, identification of people, you know, that really would help to 
solve the financial inclusion because we find that some people are excluded because they cannot be identified, they don't have an ID. So innovations around that, but that's just my my personal point of view. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Many comments. Greg, are you going to add as many comments as well? I'll try and keep it to a sentence. Um, <laughs> I think I spoke quite strongly about understanding the user problem that you, you, you're trying to solve and, and using technology. So those will go in the box. The, the one that I will add is don't underestimate the value of partnerships or collaborations. I think you know, you're know you naive if you think you're going to solve everything. And picking the, the fight that you want to fight and, and identifying good partners to work with, I think is key in, in, you know, in innovating in any space, let alone just you know, financial inclusion. So I think partnership and collaboration are, are probably like for us, or for me, and advice would be like a key ingredient um, to, to figure out. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm financial technology and equipment. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. A massive thank you uh, to my panelists for uh, the invigorating and I think a very robust conversation on what we can learn from and look forward to uh, as we embed inclusive technology into uh, a society that is active, that is curious, uh, that is engaging on not only traditional but also emerging uh, innovations as it relates to the oracle of fintech inclusive solutions uh, across multiple verticals that we've had the pleasure to discuss on the page. Uh, including uh, payments, uh, subtech governance, just to mention a few. That was, of course, Keith Sabilika, who's the senior fintech specialist at the FSCA. Graeme Cumming, the chief product officer at Ikoka, and Vincent Majago, the technical lead at Old Mutual. Thank you once again, uh, gentlemen. Uh, now.